Hey everyone, welcome to Honest Health Chats. Today I'm lucky to be joined by Emily Gilbert. Uh, she is a sports massage therapist based in Sheffield, UK. She's had a career change from biomedical science to massage therapy with an interest in pain. I've been following her on Instagram as Framework Sports Massage for a while now. Really appreciate all the hard work and uh, knowing as a fellow kind of content and provider online, there's a lot of background uh, efforts. So very interested in using this opportunity to, to network as a virtual coffee. Um, and also, Emily, I had a little stalk into your website and I hear you might know of slash like Subfocus, DJ Fresh, oh, Netski, love drum and Miro. Bass. Yes, absolutely. Reliving love my drum 2010s and bass. kind of drum and bass EDM days. Apparently I never left them. So <laughs> <laughs> love it. I'm still there. <laughs> for those who don't know you, if you don't mind an introduction for our listeners, who are you? Yeah, of course. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Emily. Um, I, uh, I feel like a lot of the people that you have on have these incredible career paths with loads of highlights. Um, I tend to make decisions very quickly based on what I fancy doing in the moment. So I studied as I actually, uh, so if we, if we go back, uh, I was looking at becoming a professional dancer. Um, I made the decision at 19 not to go into the world of ballet for a plethora of reasons. Um, I actually then went on to study physiotherapy for two years, decided I did not enjoy the course, which is interesting where I've ended up now. Um, moved on to biomedical science, uh, worked as a biomed for seven years um, and had a brief stint in environmental science and then decided I did not enjoy my career anymore. Saw an advert for a sports massage therapy course in Sheffield, did the course, quit my job and went straight into the, to that career would not advise it was hard <laughs> wow so the initially was physiotherapy for two years at university yep. two and years. then transitioned yep. to biomedical science biomedical I'm curious, science yeah what, what you, you sound like you mentioned you didn't enjoy it could you expand um, on, like what was as much as you're yeah, wanting to go into uh, at the time as well what did you not really like or what didn't vibe with you I I don't, I found it exceptionally cliquey, which mm. I just wasn't particularly keen on. But I think also just bear in mind as a 19 year old, you, you don't know what you want to do. Like you don't know how you're going to fit into work environments. You don't know where your focus wants to be. Um, I just really wasn't enjoying the course, which I know sounds very simple and, and kind of a little bit, I don't know, not well thought out, but um, I just wasn't enjoying the content of the course um as we came towards the end of the second year I broke my arm quite badly uh skiing and again based on my decision making in life where if there's something I'm not a fan of I just tend to make a, a decision in a different direction um I was going to have to repeat quite a large proportion of my second year um and placement because obviously I couldn't be on placement with a broken arm um so I then decided I've, I've always loved science um I decided to move into biomedical science and I, I don't regret it. I thoroughly enjoyed my career um, until it was time to, to change. Yeah. Wow. The um, it, it really sucks looking back and I've spoken to a few um, educators um, within physiotherapy. If you're a wheelchair user or if you're kind of, if you're physically disabled as well, it's hard to um, go through placement yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. so a lot of people uh, who are wheelchair users go to OT or another profession. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your experience. Um, and oh, it's fine. The biomedical science. Did you mm -hmm. have um, also um, after the degree some some stint mm -hmm. in the workforce as a biomedical scientist? Yeah. Person? So uh, in the UK, uh, when you qualify as a biomed, you qualify as a trainee, and then you do a two year rotational placement. Um, so similar to a lot of the medical professions over here, uh, I worked in hematology, uh, specifically uh, looking at testing around AIDS, HIV, hepatitis, um, specifically in prisons and in um, the problematic drug use community um, to provide as safe a possible as an environment for, for those people finding themselves, sorry, finding themselves in those circumstances. Um, unfortunately, the services got cut due to funding um, and it very much just became 
an industry that I just kind of wasn't wasn't particularly wanting to to work in anymore it became very political as everything does fighting for funding um and yeah I just fancied a change yeah wow the and was it hematology if I heard you hematology yeah 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 yeah. Um, and this was like in a a, like a laboratory kind of setting testing yes it was an outreach program so it was on-site testing for um for pr- prison services and then for um community services for problematic drug users specifically heroin crack cocaine users um anybody that would inject drugs basically yeah wow and uh imagine were there some skills that you've like transferred into your work with uh with clients in in massage therapy throughout those two years plus the biomedical degree plus some of the, um, I guess, navigating the the funding kind of issues and interactions? Yeah, I think um, probably one of the main skills I think I've taken away from it is to view people as people and not just what they are going through in that moment in their, their life. Um, I think if you're going to work in settings where people are predominantly judged by society and systems, um, you, you can't go in and work in those those systems and be a judgmental person and I think I've taken that that forward to look at the person always work with the person not their specific set of course the set of circumstances are important but the set of circumstances don't exist in a vacuum that person doesn't exist in a vacuum um and hopefully ju- just be a bit more compassionate towards people and not view people as us versus them and I think it was very pivotal in my career actually doing that work it was I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, wow. The uh, I know there's a, a lot of stigma in the communities, um, and I imagine you had to kind of navigate that area. Uh, I'm, from what I've heard, healthcare professionals don't really get the training, um, at least the the formal kind of training. But there's on on the job kind of training, um, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot to learn there on the go. We kind of um, is that was that your experience working with that community yeah it it was but i always felt very supported which was great so we always worked with other other professionals um i never felt unsafe if that's a question that people would want to to know um and i think genuinely if you treat people as people and not as somebody who is so far removed from your own situation then you will interact with a person as a person and it will be a lovely interaction and a lot of the time, these people that we were working with, it was the first time that somebody had actually sat down and had a proper conversation with them um, rather than just a judgmental interaction. So that was really lovely. Um, yeah, I, I think I took a lot away from that. And it, it does really factor into the way I structure a lot of my my sessions as a, as a sports massage therapist. I mean, I'm sure you'd agree just coming from a person first approach. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting when we dive into some people's histories and, and having the privilege of uh, a podcast where I can kind of mm-hmm. uh, be curious and, and learn people have been journalists, people have been um, out in a <clears throat> completely different career. And there's so much experience, lived experience that we can use within the world of MSK pain uh, rehab. Um, so that's yeah, really cool. The, the mm-hmm. skills can transfer across with the kind of human person centered approaches mm-hmm. um, and sports massage therapy What's it like in, in the UK and uh, how, how long? What was the, the training like, your experience then? Okay. Uh, it is not a regulated profession. Mm. Um, it is quite wild out there. There's a, there's a lot of different approaches going on. There's a lot of different um, beliefs as to how somebody should practice. Uh, my training, which I think is probably one of the longer trainings, was a year and a half, but that was made up of two separate courses. Um, some people can train in a weekend with no previous knowledge of how to work with people, any MSK experience, um, any kind of uh, physiological, anatomical background. Um, and then some courses, obviously, like the the courses that Anna, um, Matt and Becky offer that you I know you've spoken to before. I'm a huge fan of their work. Um, theirs is definitely one of the that well it is probably one of the best courses that is is available in the UK at the moment and I think things need to change how when you get into the conversation of kind of regulation and um 
legislation around unregulated industries is quite a complex, complex topic, and I can't see it happening anytime soon. But there definitely needs to be some alterations on courses. Um, I know there are a couple of courses at the moment that are still teaching quite unhelpful narratives, but because it's such a struggle to change the curriculum of the course, they are almost uh, advising their students that what we are teaching you isn't in line with current evidence, but you're going to need it to pass the exam. Very interesting. Is... There's a delay in that like assessment procedure versus what the teachers currently want to yeah. teach. Absolutely. And then, of course, there are always the... Uh, I guess the, the educators that are going to teach a very kind of treatment dependency model, which is incredibly frustrating. Uh, and recently I have been working with a few people that have bought packages of hundreds of appointments to see no improvement in their pain. And then to be told, maybe you're just untreatable. Maybe what's going on with you isn't compatible with massage. And it's it's just incredibly frustrating to try and I mean, first of all, build trust again with that person that's probably had a huge amount of trust broken and then to start to maybe try and dismantle very carefully some narratives that have really been ingrained around their circumstances if they've had hundreds of appointments with one person. Wow. The kind of rebooking retention based um, that's within, <clears throat> I guess, dependent on the the educator. Is it, so it starts there at, at kind of college in training to kind of yeah. um, have reasoning, clinical reasoning for repeat sessions, like weekly, bi-weekly for various reasons. Yeah, I think the reasoning is not great. Um, a lot of the time it's to keep you injury free uh, or to uh, kind of those like buzzwords, like bulletproof your body, which is, I don't know what that means like it's just it's one of those phrases isn't it that says something quite profound but means absolutely nothing at the same time um I also think clinic spaces from a business point of view want that rebooking model and a lot of the time they will look at analytics kind of month on month fortunately I have never worked in clinics like that but I know colleagues that have where they are encouraged to rebook people weekly bi-weekly monthly um and they are kind of put on performance reviews if that isn't happening which is it's not something that sits very comfortably with me <laughs> at all no and it's a shame that it comes from the training as well so then everyone mm -hmm. gets it across the board it's like the status quo so then to yeah. do something different would be the challenge what it means to be a massage therapist i imagine mm -hmm. um it's kind yeah. of countercultural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel very lucky again that it was never something that, that the clinics that I previously worked at encouraged, which is I'm incredibly grateful for. But it's always interesting when you have a conversation at the end of a session with somebody and their immediate question a lot of the time, especially if it's the first time as working together is how many massages should I have? When should I book back in? And to try and maybe move the control back into to, to their court. So, so they I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer of the person that you're working with has control over everything that we we do. Um, they lead and we just kind of, you know, direct and guide. But uh, those conversations are interesting. And when when you kind of do have those conversations, they're like, oh, I thought I was going to have to book a block of 10 sessions or 20 sessions or like jokes that I was getting my credit card ready. And it's it doesn't it sits very uncomfortably with me. Wow. So it molds the expectations that clients mm -hmm. have um, within the entire community um yeah i think the the flow on effects to of like misinformation is uh under represented or not talked about enough i feel the the harms associated with that um mm -hmm. the my mind goes to the kind of simplistic solution so what would um i know this is going to be a question in general like the how what would you like change in the whole world of massage therapy i guess from maybe if we stick with education what do you feel mm -hmm. is, is needed What what within the world mm. of sports massage therapy or massage therapy? It's, it's interesting because I, I think about this a lot and I think it's a kind of, I mean, definitely some things that are just wildly out of date need to be removed from courses. I think that would be incredibly easy from the start not to talk about muscle knots, not to talk about release of toxins, which is my, as an ex-biomed, that's my white whale. I'm like, what toxins are you talking about? What, what? Um, the, these kind of unhelpful beliefs around posture and movement and being able to change 
joint positioning with with massage these kind of things I think if they were just removed from the courses that would be incredibly helpful I don't know if they will be um I think the courses should have more content around how to work with a person and not work with a person's muscles or tendons or ligaments or a person's injury because as massage therapists we are holding space for people a lot of time in quite a distressing time in their lives or a I mean as as you do as physios do as everybody kind of who works in MSK or pain care does but I think interestingly with massage we have a lot of quiet time with the people that we're working with um we are asking them to remove their clothes and we are putting their hands on our hands on them often as strangers um I think if there was more education on how to create a safe and comfortable environment in that respect rather than what are we releasing can we find the piriformis like but then it's it's managing kind of what people what people who are working with therapists want and what maybe the direction of the industry should be going in because there's always going to be a mismatch for a good period of time I think yeah more skills with the uh updated narratives first of all and skills mm-hmm. with handling mm-hmm. uh kind of like psychologically informed massage therapy yeah um uh, yeah so hearing the the toxin narratives during your training mm-hmm. based off your biomedical degree would have raised mm-hmm. a few alarm bells initially so kind of got you along yeah. the kind of critical thinking skeptical path from the from the get-go yeah, I, I love research. I love reading research. It's It sounds so sad, but I do really enjoy reading research. Um, And I, I don't know if this is a good thing to share. So I have OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder as well. So I'm very detail oriented, um, which was fantastic as a biomedical scientist, um, because you have a lot more kind of quantitative work that you're doing moving into massage obviously um and working with people in pain working with a person not just a body of cells. Uh, there's a lot more um kind of unknown so that's that's been interesting to to work through um but I I am a bit of a I'm a bit of a word pedant I think I I, I'm not a massive fan of things that sound like they're saying something but actually mean nothing and you see a lot of these phrases um or I think we we spoke on on uh, messages as well of these kind of before and after photos showing more range of movement muscles might look slightly different um somebody's massaging and you can see the skin rolling and they're like look at look at that not almost priming somebody to see what they they want them to see um it really irks me <laughs> it, it, it really bothers me but uh I also think it just just from speaking with people that I work with as well the kind of similar conversations come up it's like that sounded like something I needed to be concerned about but I didn't really understand what it was and nobody explained it to me so I think we need to get clearer our communication as massage therapists. I don't, I don't want to say, obviously, of course, everybody across the board does not work in the same way, but there are a lot of saying a lot of words without meaning anything in massage to try and potentially create a working relationship with a, with a client, with somebody um, potentially leading to treatment dependency. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. There's um, uh, even research done where uh, with dry needling and how to Mm -hmm. um, do it in a way that's a sham. And they've kind of, they invested uh, the help of magicians. And it kind of reminds me of the the way that magicians, like we we kind of believe our eyes, we have that, that visual input Mm -hmm. just has a different uh, effect on us as humans. So uh, I imagine if people can see the, whatever you want to call it, the, the knots being released um, the other mm-hmm. one that comes to mind with needling is like the the, the fascicles they can the, the twitch kind of mechanism um and, and mm-hmm. like seeing that it's like oh wow so it must be working um, yeah and it kind of goes yeah. along the body as machine the outdated narratives that people already have because they've got tight yeah. muscles so they think that there are not so it's just a reinforcing yeah cycle Abs- absolutely and i think it's that um it's creating narratives about around something around two different kind of aspects that may have completely nothing to do with each other that wasn't a good sentence but um uh, yeah it, it happens a lot this is happening and I'm doing this so I must be causing this and um yeah it's 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 interesting it's interesting to see play out but when you do ask kind of for reasoning behind it it's obviously it's it's met with quite a lot of aggression sometimes um or I wouldn't understand, or the client wouldn't understand, or um, we're ahead of science, which is another thing that comes up quite a lot. Um, 
I think there's a lot of that that, that goes on in the massage space. I'm sure it goes on in other MSK spaces as well. I'm sure it does. Yeah, there's so many reasons, valid ones, where it's like, oh, that's my worth. That's what I do, mm -hmm. but it works, but people love yeah. me and they come back and there's a reinforcing mm -hmm. um, kind of process. So it can be very mm -hmm. uh, personal attack kind of as an interpretation when when challenging or questioning that. Um, so so uh, I'm zooming out and seeing the protective factor of your biomedical mm -hmm. degree, um, which is awesome. And the, you mentioned like the, the irk that it gives you when it's like people aren't really specific with their words or they're not really mm -hmm. mindful or thoughtful of the meaning of what they're saying, or if what they're saying is, uh, has been rigorously tested, what the science says about that. Um, so that's like, if, if more people were like you, that'd be amazing. Um, but it's hard with people who maybe aren't taught the scientific process or who aren't really taught that there is a uh, value in updating and changing your mind. Um, and there's more to like yeah. the value. There's much more in, in the interaction. There's much more in the context that you can create along with the power of touch without the need for like, I do specific techniques or specific um, uh, yeah, interventions to fix things. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I think when when we kind of look at the the education as well, there's lots of conversations that, that come up around accessibility of people going to university and being able to have the privilege of being taught how to read research. It's not a skill that people are just you're not born with the skill. You you learn the skill. Um, but I think if we could, especially if people are coming from a background that is completely unrelated to anything MSK, pain related, science related, massage related, movement related, if the courses from the start were a little bit more I think maybe a little bit more up to date. Hopefully, it would set people off on a on a better kind of footing to to move forward. Um, yeah, it's interesting. But then coming back to evidence as well. I mean, a lot of the people that I work with, unfortunately, there is very little evidence around those those population groups. Um, for example, so yesterday uh, I provide massage to adults with learning and intellectual disabilities at a day service centre. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we know research around people with with disabilities is so unbelievably poor. It's there's so little to, to to go on for for a number of reasons. Obviously, there's a huge reason around consent for a lot of people. Not all people, but um, the consent and moral moral and ethical quandaries. But again, just using research to to direct your practice, I think get, we we need to use it to inform and guide. But it it can't be that we only do what the research says otherwise I probably wouldn't work with three quarters of my client base because they are not included in research a lot of the time so it's yeah, interesting the uh, evidence-centered or <clears throat> evidence-only practice that we, we can't really do with, with a lot of populations it, with and this is I can speak with um this exercise there's, there's uh, even um, gaps in research, even though it yeah. is so widely researched, um, the, there's still limitations. <laughs> and also um, the understanding of like evidence-based practice is a cookbook or evidence-based practice is exactly the formula of what to do for this yeah. individual is that also requires, I, I feel, formal training and educators <laughs> and examples yeah. um, and proper support and resources. They're ongoing, mm -hmm. um, which it, it still is very much needed um, in across the board so that the culture of science-based practice is essential. Um, and I think yeah. Instagram is a, a, an avenue that uh, I know about your experience, but an avenue that I've seen a lot more people and have kind of been able to mold my own little echo chamber of uh, reliable people that are communicating yeah. the science in simple, mm -hmm. accessible ways. Um, and there's so much potential for um, having that for clients as well as for yeah. colleagues to see examples and to start these discussions that are needed. Absolutely. And I think for me as well, um, Instagram has been pivotal in being able to start to understand uh, philosophy, philosophical approaches, um, philosophical frameworks, which maybe four or five years ago, I was very much coming from a science background. I was like, oh, philosophy, if they haven't found a definitive answer in the last 3000 years, then why are we still going on about it? Which is a terrible attitude to have. But um, it's, I mean, 
it's it hugely shapes how I how I work as a massage therapist and I would say currently I mean it's obviously not an, an end process as as we have you know more information out there but um the inactivist model is hugely pivotal in the way I work with people and it probably really does drive the majority of my my work um because what we do again it doesn't exist in a vacuum in the context of a session with that person lying on a massage table there's a whole environment going on around them internally externally macro environments micro it, it's yeah it is it, it, I, I, I love that I know we shouldn't really have bias towards models but especially somebody who struggled a little bit with the BPS model and how to use it to framework my work um the inactivist model I really do I really do like I think it fits very well with massage and how we can explain how massage can can work and operate within people's environments um yeah I, I found that really pivotal in in moving my work forward when I felt a little bit stuck or not kind of quite sure how I wanted to be working I think a lot of the philosophical models really helped yeah that's shape the framework to kind of underlie everything is um I think we we have the frameworks I, I don't think we get the chance to reflect on what frameworks we have like why do we think things are working or how things work in in our uh conceptual maps our mental models mm -hmm. so yeah yeah absolutely. one the inactive model is um shown as like a theoretically um based like philosophically based one like an underlying one it's mm -hmm. like oh this makes so much more sense um so then we can yeah, all kind yeah, of yeah. have at least a similar um thinking framework yeah. of pain of interactions with humans mm -hmm. of um how we are part of the environment the environment the environment the context that we're working with within is part of us um and how things work like the effects yes. the interaction the relationship yeah. between different factors biopsychosocial factors because it's so easy to be yeah. uh, like in a linear model of like i apply this thing i release this muscle and therefore mm -hmm. symptoms improve but it's yeah not like that um how no. Have you had, um, so I'm wondering with, within our EP physio kind of world, mm -hmm. physical therapy yeah. broadly, um, there can be a bit of pushback when people start talking about something that's outside of norm in general, mm. uh, which is very normal and to be expected. So when people bring up philosophy, people are like, oh, yeah, I'm a philosopher. Or if yeah, yeah, uh, people start talking or questioning um, about, say, interventions from another profession, they're like, hey, mm -hmm. you're not from that profession. Why, why are you yeah. even talking about that have you had any kind of backlash in general or, or um, critiques when discussing kind of things outside of I guess status quo massage therapy no I think that's awesome. that's a really easy answer and I yeah. like I wish I had a more interesting answer but um I think where where I am so in, in Sheffield in the UK I know it's not you know insular to Sheffield but we have such a wonderful um environment and culture of working with other professionals and I think because there is a huge amount of uh, people who work um, individually here within pain care, MSK care, medical care, uh, we've kind of all found each other which is wonderful and um, we meet up regularly, we talk regularly, we've got WhatsApp groups, um, it's like the geekiest WhatsApp group ever just sending each other research papers um, but it's it's a lovely environment and it obviously the, the it, it's very supportive for us as professionals but it's also incredibly useful to have um to be able to send people that we're working with that we are not as equipped to to work with um so no I, I, I don't know if you wanted a more interesting answer but no no <laughs> I want it to be hard for you how dare you um no perfect oh uh, my gosh I'm jealous it's Coming great I think that's needed it's, that community yeah. is like collaborative it's, it's supportive and everyone's kind of um contributing uh so it's not like yeah. a um I guess there's a obligation to be there or there's no, no. competition is another one that comes up within like no. you know referral it's, no maybe, maybe there is and I'm just unaware of it but um I, I'm not a big fan of I don't feel like this kind of competitive mindset benefits the people that you're working with anyway um if people want to work with me they'll work with me if I'm not suitable then there's plenty of other people I can refer to I think what's really nice as well in our kind of 
um, environment in Sheffield is we have a lot of like non pain care professionals as well. So um, a lot of wonderful kind of activities, groups, social aspects for uh, people that, you know, may, may find it difficult to attend a gym or may find it difficult to I don't know I'm trying to think of any activity in the world and I can't think of anything uh but uh, but there's a lovely interaction between um people especially who work with people in pain or with, with kind of persistent health conditions um looking beyond just treating that person in the kind of environment when they're working together and and maybe looking at what more would they like out of their situation what services can we refer to uh what groups are accessible for them and that's a really lovely a really lovely thing to be able to do because we don't just work with people in in a vacuum in in the one-to-one -one session you know life is beyond that and it's really nice to be able to do that beyond just kind of referring to somebody for a frozen shoulder or I don't know for for a um a dark, but whatever kind of you know whatever you would refer on for but uh I really do value that it's lovely to be able to have those those environments and also pe people with persistent health conditions have met friends and other people with health conditions that are similar to theirs and um I think we're creating a bit of a wider environment in Sheffield kind of and a bit of a maybe a more social aspect to pain care which I think is really exciting um it's it's, it's great so no it's not difficult here at all even though I'm, I'm sorry to everybody that it's difficult for but we, we feel very lucky yeah that's amazing really lucky the community aspect has been fostered has it been <laughs> um the case like for some years has it been since kind of any kind of turning events in over history with COVID for instance everyone going online um with like a, a group of people that's been just growing over time with the networking collaborating coffee meetups WhatsApp yeah. groups online space in-person spaces yeah. um and I also know the context of NHS from my understanding there's like group activities is is encouraged yeah. for yeah. referral mm -hmm. networks yeah so we we have something in the uk called social prescribing which is looking at activities groups <clears throat> interactions for people that are dealing with whatever that they are dealing with um whether it's kind of as accessible in the, the public space in terms of nhs space i mean if anybody knows the state of the nhs at the moment it's incredibly stretched over here in the uk it's not in a good good position at all um but they they are they are offering that depending on where you live but the um the private kind of sector I definitely think is pushing forward with that and a lot of these groups are free as well so hopefully cost isn't a barrier for people <clears throat> sorry with, my hay fever is absolutely kicking my head in <laughs> clear your throat when as much as you need um but yeah I'm wondering with the <clears throat> social prescribing and you mentioned cost that seems to be a factor mm -hmm. um yeah at least in my neck of the woods in in Sydney with rising mm -hmm. cost of living and I'm sure there's also oh that yeah absolutely across in your neck of the woods um mm -hmm. so with the groups uh, I'm assuming by groups it's like walking groups or mm -hmm. other kind of activities uh, yeah. meditation or uh, specific populations what kind of groups yeah. like are there in your yeah, community all sorts so we've got we've got walking groups uh we've got walking groups specifically for people with autism we've got walking groups for uh people that are maybe walking is extremely difficult for them so it'll be a shorter amount of time with lots of breaks um we've got uh weightlifting groups which is incredible um we've got uh things like pottery we've got things like poetry <laughs> there's Sheffield is a really um wonderfully I think diverse city with lots and lots of different activities going on and people tend to be very vocal about them as well which is great so they're not kind of hidden away um or behind so... a paywall <clears throat> and behind a paywall yeah, absolutely. unless so... you have that kind of constant stream of income like in, I'm absolutely. thinking gym memberships right there's um there's a cost mm -hmm. involved uh, yeah would, would that be absolutely. the case you mentioned weightlifting group is that like a gym what um door? So, what's the a uh, gym gym space so it's actually uh, there's a couple of gyms that, that offer them in in Sheffield for as free free sessions once a week um yeah it's it's amazing we we have a really really great community here and a lot of the time the businesses will um work at a no charge for that that session so it isn't behind a paywall um because a paywall as we know stops a lot of people engaging in a lot of things so uh my mind goes to uh is Sheffield now a, a communist kind of 
group <laughs> how does it work in the within it's, the uh, business and um, yeah it's amazing i i, I want to know all the secrets <laughs> yeah. tell me everything so i can uh, do this right I, now in sydney i think we definitely have um a kind of more of a socialist framework here um and fortunately we have a lot of businesses that pay for services so they are free to people that cannot afford to pay for them which is fantastic um I for example have um I have clients that pay forward appointments with me so then I can work for people work with people for no charge which is incredible um so an example of that is I work with a charity for people that have fled domestic violence. I'm working alongside a psychologist at the moment, um, reintroducing touch into people's lives um, from what's been an incredibly distressing previous experience. Um, I work for no charge with, with that charity um, because people pay forward appointments to be able to cover cover the cost, which is just and pay forward for incredible. Um just to explain clarify it's like mm -hmm. you pay for your session and you also pay yep. a certain amount that you're yep. willing to pay that yep. you know will so, be for someone who can't pay for somebody wow, who can't that's amazing yep. it's really great uh it's it's yeah we we have a lovely culture here i'm sure there are parts of sheffield that are not great as well but we do have a a, a great um kind of pay it forward culture which is really really nice um and incredibly valuable Wow. The, so, okay. Pay forward. Um, I'm thinking yeah. like step-by-step, step, how do I do this mm -hmm. in Sydney? Um, okay. Communities and there'd be businesses willing to um, have groups that mm -hmm. come into your business mm -hmm. and yeah. you, you provide the service for them service, as well yeah. for yeah. without yeah. charge. Yeah. Without charge. So uh, there's, uh, some wonderful weightlifting groups in Sheffield. So, yeah, the either the trainer will work for no charge for that session, or um, the gym will cover the session for the trainer, which is incredible. Um, there's a huge strongman, strongwoman culture in Sheffield as well. So we have a lot of you know competitive strongman, strongwoman gyms, which I think is such an incredible way to exercise as well, because you are literally lifting things, throwing things, and um, it fosters an incredible sense of community. Um, and some people just choose for that session to work for no charge. I do it for a number of um, organizations as well, and I'm happy to. Um, and making contact with great. those organizations, what was that process? Yeah. Uh, I am a big fan of just ask if you want to work with somebody. Um, for example, I was actually going to speak to you later in the year to ask if we could have a conversation. So this worked out perfectly. Uh, so thank you. I knew that. Um, you knew that. <laughs> intuition I, I i'm yeah no <laughs> um uh but uh, sorry like email cold emails <laughs> like DMs, yeah, yeah yeah of course uh, basically so hey of... i'm in the area um i'm just thinking like yeah. simple script for yeah any listener yeah, yeah absolutely myself included uh, so yeah a lot of um a lot of organizations if you follow their instagrams uh they are always reaching out for services um to provide to the the, the people that use their services so um Hi, uh, I'm I'm Emily. I'm a sports massage therapist working throughout Sheffield. Um, I have experience working with. Da, 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 da. Uh, I would like to offer some of my time to you if it's a service you would like to include to your users. Um, sometimes you'll get a response. Sometimes you won't. Um, and it, obviously there has to be a balance. You can't just completely work for free, or most people can't completely work for free all the time. But I think being able to just offer some of your time if it is feasible. Um, to an organization that otherwise wouldn't have access to those services, I think is really, really valuable. Wow. That's incredible. I think there's, uh, and I'm just thinking of the barriers that would come up. Have you had any uh, challenges? Obviously the worst case, they don't get back to you. You get ghosted. Yep. Okay. Yep. Rejection or yep. they, they're not looking for your service. Yep. Um, yeah. but you keep the connection and you, there's plenty Absolutely, of other yeah. kind of organizations um, so charities yeah. is what you mentioned. Any yeah, other charities, kind of yeah. people to reach out to? Um, like Google search I, charities in your area kind of thing. Yeah. Google search charities in your area. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think because I think it's quite it's happened quite naturally with me as well, just from kind of networking with other other professionals because a lot of the time we we kind of just link up and discuss what what we could maybe offer. Um, 
just trying to think like it, it I think just reaching out just ask as to whether uh, you know it's it's something that you would that they would want from you uh, I know there's a there's a gym in Sheffield a strongman gym uh, that is very ho- focused on working with people going through drug and alcohol addiction uh, so they hold uh, weekly strongman sessions for um, people going through treatment programs or struggling at the moment and uh, a proportion of the public's membership goes to cover those sessions and that's written into the contract when they sign up for the gym um the gym will also take anybody going through those programs who is wanting to qualify as a personal trainer through their uh, personal training um program and pay for it so i think it's just kind of finding where where people can afford to maybe offer a little bit more monetary wise and then using that in a in a good way i think for lack of a better word um but we are we are pretty good at that in Sheffield. We are. Wow. The and there's other people also doing similar um with reaching out to people or I I yeah, yeah, heard yeah, of yeah. the kind of it's pro bono work essentially. Yeah, yeah, essentially. And I think we're kind of in a we, we do live in a city where people just ask for things. Uh like northern northern England, um, people are quite open and straightforward, which I really like. So if um if they are looking for something, they will ask for it, which I think is brilliant. Um, yeah, and I think we've just cultivated a really nice environment in Sheffield where professionals will work together and reach out and offer different services and um, people take them up. Wow. Yeah, because I, I, there's a question that I ask a lot of um, clinicians <clears throat> from my own kind of curiosity and also having some reflections mm-hmm. on on moving forward within healthcare is if in an ideal world, um, the belief of everyone deserving access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that includes those who can't afford a session. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think if there's ways that steps, small steps that we can take towards that within our community, um, if there is the Mm -hmm. time, uh, I I imagine uh, for those who maybe don't have the autonomy at work to offer that, that might be a a barrier. Um, Of course, yeah, absolutely. The, what comes to mind if, if there are listeners who are like thinking about maybe some steps, maybe having a, a chat with their employer or with their mm-hmm. colleagues to see if there's something that they can do as a collective. Um, yep. I imagine it can be, you know, you can sneak in. It's good marketing for the, the brand, the business to reach out to offer that. Maybe not, you know, every single day, Absolutely. but once a week, yeah. this is the group class yeah. that we can offer this space yep. um, or once a month even. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, genuinely as simple as it sounds well first have a sit sit down have a conversation see what the clinic space can offer because not everything can not everyone can offer the same thing but just from previous experience when you ask people tend to be quite forthcoming with their their time um and uh yeah I think just just kind of have have a chat about what I guess group of people that you would want to work with do you have time what is what what's the accessibility of your clinic um because I've definitely worked in a clinic before you could only get entry by stairs so obviously that is so it's it's different uh, so kind of maybe look at what is available who you would like to work with um I know a lot of the GP surgeries so just general practice doctors here um a lot of surgeries are more open to private businesses coming in and being forthcoming with their services um and then they can recommend them to patients which is a really nice in as well um but I think just start having a conversation because a lot of clinics, I think, that work on one-to-one sessions, that is their focus. It's like back-to-back, got to get as many people in as possible. Um, but there are inevitable spaces that can be used for maybe more community outreach, community services. Um, so potentially just have a sit down with whoever you would need to speak to at your clinic, maybe speak to your colleagues. Um don't go barging in and just say this is what I want and this is what we're going to do because that will probably not go down well. But um, I'm a big fan of just asking. Wow. If you don't ask, you don't get. So it makes complete sense. I think my mistake. Uh, so uh, with the kind of public outreach post, it's yeah. not personal. It's not a direct message. But I think there is something yeah. about that uh, individualized, personalized message. Um, yeah. Versus like, hey, uh, I'm. Is anyone? looking for do you know someone with pain for instance like a general yeah yeah, yeah, post. yeah, it's like, yeah. Oh, you, and yeah. so I'm, the thing that I've been doing has been recorded consults 
um, for mm. free. So I think having that opportunity if with obviously willingness and consent, um, which is helpful for not only that patient, but also for uh, people who do mentoring with me. So it's like, oh, here's yeah. an example of a consult. Um, so you, you have no idea, maybe speak, I'll reach out again in a, in a month or so. Um, this is yeah, uh, do not it, life yeah. changing, but career kind of changing. Cause I was like thinking about what, what I can do um, personally. Yeah. And I'm sure there's other mm-hmm. listeners who are on the same boat um, who are yeah. keen to make a change and feel a bit stuck. I think the the yeah. um, kind of profit centered approaches around me is what uh, I've seen and has kind of clouded my experience. Um, mm-hmm. So even just knowing that it's a possibility from you mm-hmm. has been so enlightening. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's yeah. I think it's um, when we look at say like even going back to like the BPS framework, so social you know social interaction is so important like forming connections and groups and it's incredibly difficult to do that in a one-to-one setting with the person that you're working with for say the hour um but then if we can say oh we can offer this we could recommend this to you we could do this you know um and a lot of the time the person that they're working with I mean frequently I'll be like I'll be there as well so they'll be a familiar face um but people form friendships people form connections and it's it's wonderful it's it's really wonderful wow it's incredible. Um, so I'm excited. I've made a list. I will yeah. get to it. Um, for I mentioned earlier, things that you'd like to change within mm-hmm. the world of massage. Um, yeah. I know that I'm going to steal some tips for changing my world community here with a kind of social aspect, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, what What do you feel? We've talked about education, um, touching mm-hmm. on what what would be beneficial from a science perspective, mm-hmm. evidence based practice yeah. perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking at uh, updating some of the the mm-hmm. beliefs and the narratives yeah. out there. Um, what else would be some of the features uh, in your ideal kind of utopia for the world of massage? I think I would love for people, massage therapists, to understand that they are working with a person again, not not just just not just muscles, not just tendons, not just ligaments, whatever part of the body people are working with. Um, I think potentially looking outside of their work um and not it's hard to say uh, not not posting on social media for for ego or for clout look at the difference that I've made to this person's muscle because I, I, that doesn't sit well with me um I think moving away as well from this biomechanical biomedical model of massage where uh, we are again just focusing on what we can do to somebody but more focusing on rather the space and the experience we can hold for that person depending on what they are going through in their their life the body they live in their experience that they're having um, because I think in sports massage unfortunately we're still very much taught to work with athletes which I do I do work with athletes but it's not the majority of, of my work um, and I also think the narrative that sports massage has to be painful needs to die um but i think that comes back to the breaking down of things releasing things no pain no gain narrative um the majority of people that i work with massage does not look like that yep, unless so they wanted to yeah so looking at the person-centered approach uh maybe mm-hmm. exploring venturing into different professions or different uh yep. domains of knowledge um so kind of reading widely and um, mm-hmm. yeah. following, expanding, like people, content creators, uh, other professions, people within yeah, absolutely. healthcare as well. Like mm-hmm. there's so much yeah. within humanities, within um, looking at psychologists, for instance, mental health, as well as physical health or any other mm-hmm. interest areas. Um, yeah. And yeah, ex- exploring the massage, the power of touch through mm-hmm. more than just a biomedical, biomechanical narrative. Um, and yeah. using the power of social media to connect with people and with yeah, the community. Absolutely. Um, did, did I get the main points in this utopia? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think you uh, conceptualized it far better than I did. So thank you for that. Um, Based off your uh, great thoughts. Yeah, I, so. no, <laughs> my, what, my constant narrative that is going on in my brain. Um, yeah, I, I, I think if we, I, I would love to move forward into a space where we are much more person first rather than muscle first, ligament first injury first it needs to be part of it but it's not people are not 
just their muscles are they they're not just the injury they're not just their pain um and I think what we find really interesting with massage a lot of the time is people talk to us um maybe a lot more than sometimes they do with physios or chiros or osteos because we have time together where to quote a lot of other MSK professionals we are utilizing passive treatment which I'm not entirely sure I agree with but um people do open up to us and we tend to find and I found this in clinic spaces um conversations have opened up that have not opened up in previous uh appointments so I think knowing that a person is just much more than you know their muscles their tendons their ligaments um you are working with a person that's probably got a lot going on in their life as well and if they want to tell you that that's great if they don't fine but just understand that they are more than the muscle that you're massaging I think yeah so well said the incredible value of having a <laughs> non-rushed appointment eh, if I was to kind yeah of it's frame it that way it's huge because there's the opportunity to develop a therapeutic relationship and trust and then yeah. things emerge from that context absolutely when people feel safe yeah I think also we just need to be careful on the flip side of that is not um for lack of a better word abusing that to create treatment dependency because I think that does happen quite a lot as well and I'm, I'm just curious obviously my mind is mm -hmm. buzzing from the um incredible potential and your inspiration role modeling the the community aspect that you've done so far with reaching out to people directly um thank you the multidisciplinary care kind of the team approaches yeah. is something that yeah it, it sounds like you work with uh clients yeah. who also see other like yeah. physios psychologists yeah. other healthcare professionals yeah. uh, and you have kind of direct communication mm -hmm. with them as well like the professional mm -hmm. kind of network yeah. collaborative approach with obviously with the permission of the, the the client um but yeah it's it's wonderful um with personal trainers as well actually I feel like personal trainers are such an undervalued profession when working with people you know as part of a wider pain care picture and we have some wonderful personal trainers in in Sheffield that are very well versed in working with people with um persistent pain conditions, uh, lifelong health conditions, um, during, following a cancer diagnosis, working with adults with learning disabilities. Um, and so that's really great as well, on top of the kind of more medical, because obviously I, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a medical professional, but um, I think we tend to lean towards like physios, osteopaths, occupational therapists, um, psychologists, but personal trainers, I think they, they are, they're so undervalued a lot of the time um but they can have such a monumental impact on people's lives 100 percent. i'm in full agreement with the potential for um incredible change in someone's life when someone is seeing them consistently going through hard work and that coaching mm -hmm. element the guidance mm -hmm. the support ongoing support yeah. is massive so the personal trainers are pain informed pain science informed they are at least aware. some are some are yep yep Mm -hmm. what's yeah, it like it depends with, with that because uh, uh, my um, uh, rebuttal is like but they don't know anything about pain and I, I also agree that there's personal trainers that know more than me about everything um yeah so it really depends but um yeah, I'm thinking depends. of some listeners that are like no they don't know anything about pain yeah there are some incredible um further development kind of professional development courses now specifically for personal trainers um in London there is a uh I can send you the link. There's um, a organization called Faster Function uh, that uh, very much work in a person focused, pain informed way with people. Um, I will send you details afterwards if, if you want to share. Um, they do a lot of online training as well, which is fantastic. They've got a brilliant course called Games in Pain, I think which is essentially um, a lot of very, very creative ways to get people to, to start exploring movement um, for those living with pain or persistent conditions. And they work with such a wide range of, um, I know a couple of the trainers and I'm just, they're, they're incredible. Um, they work all the way through from um, children. I think one of my, one of my colleagues, one of my, one of my friends has, He's got a 98-year-old client. It's 
they work on a mobile basis, they work in an online space, they work in gym spaces, but I'll send you their, their information because I think you would really gel with their their messages. Um, Amazing. I Googled They're it. brilliant. There, there will be others. Faster I'm just function. not aware. Yep. Faster function. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, Amazing. And the, the, guy that, the guy that, yeah, the guy that heads it up, um, he's brilliant and he's always open to chat. Um, and then there's a number of, uh, they're very, very evidence informed, but work with a really huge range of, of people. And I think their goal is to try and make movement and exercises as accessible as possible for people. Amazing. It's incredible. Um, I, I don't, if someone is delivering a course that is evidence informed and mm -hmm. uh, regularly updated um, mm -hmm. with all the uh, kind of references, resources, and yep. uh, is delivered by a physiotherapist or an EP or a personal trainer. I don't see a difference mm -hmm. in those three. I think it's more about the the quality of the content and um, how it's being taught and delivered. So that's Absolutely. amazing, incredible. Um, what's uh, what's really lovely with their courses is they continuously update them as the evidence changes but you get lifelong access so um every time a new version of the course comes out you just get that new version of the course so wow. amazing as part of the initial kind format. of yeah cost yeah. cost wow so you can Great. have it for the rest of your life as long as the company's open yeah so wow yeah um, that's amazing they're brilliant the, so this seems to be a, a, a game changer in terms of the community because there's I think that it's needed with the the training. There needs to be external or internal kind of the the formal training, mm -hmm. university training, or and mm -hmm. or the kind of external CPD continuing education mm -hmm. um, courses out there for people to have that information across. Yeah. Um, and then there's networks and collaborations as well from there. So mm -hmm. everyone's open yeah. to collaborating, to networking, to having um, meetings, coffee. Um, yeah. Wow. That's incredible. There's um, we could talk for for ages, and I'm very mindful <laughs> of your time, respecting your time. I'm, I'm no, no, your time as well. Ten of minutes course. of of um, if you have the time, ten minutes for mm -hmm. just back and forth chat. You had yeah, questions for me, um, and I Absolutely. know you're curious about EP related things because you don't have yeah exercise physiology kind of specific. No, do you have kinesiologists? No, exercise physiologists. No, <sighs> no. No, we have sports therapists, which I think may be similar, um, which is a degree or a master's based program. Uh, we have rehabilitation, I can't remember the title, rehabilitation specialist, um, which again is similar. So we have a number of different MSK titles, professions um, that I think hopefully intertwine. I think sometimes it is still quite divisive, but hopefully people are starting to understand that maybe title is not quite as important as we once thought it was hopefully um people are starting to hopefully. see the, the collaborative <laughs> nature of things um there's clinical exercise physiologists that can yeah. work within the nhs but i'm yes, not sure how are, yeah. popular they are I, I imagine those would be you similar know. from the training perspective um than yeah. what the kind of ep degree is here yeah, and you do, I think you tend to get those uh, more in kind of sport-related um, environments, occasionally within the NHS as well. But again, with the way the funding the NHS is going at the moment, it's services are a little bit stretched for what we, we already have. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you wouldn't really have come across too many clinical EPs um, then. There would be more I for I've athlete kind of sports strength and conditioning more like uh snc strength, yeah. strength and conditioning oh, um i think i i did i don't know any personally but when i worked as a biomed i think i met it's gonna sound really weird i met one once um but it was just a brief conversation at like a kind of meeting morning type thing um but they're not something that i maybe i've i haven't been in the nhs for ages so um Maybe they are something that is, is more prevalent, but I don't think they are. Yeah, um, I, I know they're quite rare from um, yeah. my understanding, but um, if I can't really speak for EPs. It's funny, mm -hmm. going through um, the existential crises after existential crisis after existential crisis, like who am I? What's my role? Um, yep. Diving into pain. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, like, depending on who I'm talking to, I don't really, <clears throat> in general, see myself as an EP or working EP, as an yeah. EP. Um, yep. But uh, so 
a horrible start, but questions for me. Um, I'm very open to uh, what you've seen or, or curiosities. Um, yeah. I know I post a lot, so people have like these questions of what the fuck's that? Oh, <laughs> why is he posting about that? I'm just, I'm, I'm just always really interested in how people approach working with people. I know that mm. sounds really kind of reductionist, but I think everybody kind of works in a slightly different way. And it's, it's just interesting to see. I really like your recorded sessions. I think I reached out to you after, um, cause I'm part of Eric Purvis's movement, manual therapy community. And that, that's kind of when I, I, I reached out to you, but, um, I just, I really like, cause I think it's quite secretive. It's quite cloak and dagger, like how people work. It's always behind closed doors. And I think it's really amazing that you are opening that up to people to, to professionals to see what that looks like but also to the people that might be choosing to work with you so it doesn't seem like such a daunting um interaction not yep, a lot of people do that yeah you said that and it's all credits to clients who are willing and um <laughs> open to yep. being so vulnerable um especially in a kind of pain related problem mm. um and telling their story um and yet so can't thank the the clients who've been willing yeah. Um, to have a session recorded. I know I would find it mm -hmm. quite uh, daunting. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's, it's. Uh, I'm just within the the wide world, wild and wide world of yep. um, Instagram and social media, it can be easy to get misinterpretations. So uh, hopefully it's mm -hmm. not seen as like, I'm, I'm great. I'm a good therapist. Look at this. Um, this is the way that you should or shouldn't practice um, and hopefully yeah. people see it as, as a opportunity for discussions and for learning yeah. a bit more and for curiosity. Um, and yeah. they're not seeing it. This is the way you should practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's out there as well. So for any listeners, yeah. they can also DM me if they're interested in, in seeing some recordings of their kind of unlisted um, video recordings. The only thing that I've found, at least uh, they are long because they're literally a full consult. Yeah, so it doesn't yeah. really match people's um, maybe time span or attention span with yeah, uh, the yeah. quick form social media content. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only kind of disadvantage. So one day I'll hire someone mm. who can edit like little snippets, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, so you, yeah. I'm glad you've found them helpful. Yeah. Hugely helpful. And I don't think it comes across as like you being didactic or saying this is the way you should practice. I think it's just another option for people to see. Um, because I think a lot of people have only really seen, unless they've shadowed people, um, I think a lot of people have only really had kind of experience of watching interactions maybe through training or you know, if they've shadowed somebody at a clinic or on a placement and that changes over time. Like I don't know about you, but I work in a much different way to how I worked seven years ago. Thank God, um, because some of that stuff was just like, oh, you know, sometimes when you look back at what you've done and you're like, what were you talking about? Like, literally, what are you talking about? Um, so I think I think it's great. I think it's yeah. great that that people kind of get to to see that, um, and I think we could do with more of that, to be honest. Yeah, um, and it might be something I think about doing actually. That would be great. I know. Uh, I I think it was. I'm not sure if you know Taylor <laughs> James. Um, yeah. He's also doing some education along those lines with like mm -hmm. uh, whether it's role models, whether it's uh, role modeling rather, or or um, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called that psychologists do it all the time? Role play, real play is what role they yeah. try and do. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. make it like a real yeah. problem for people. Um, yeah. I think that's that practice is embarrassing at first because you have to kind of act, put on your acting a little bit, um, especially if it's in front yeah. of an audience. But it mm -hmm. is such a useful context for practicing. And for getting feedback, so um, especially with yeah. it, when it's with like a colleague or a friend. Absolutely. Um, I know when I've done um, motivational interview training and a lot of that is kind of role play, real play. And it feels really odd to start with, but you do sink into it after a while. And um, it's really helpful. Really, yeah. really helpful. And it's the opportunity to get the specific feedback that you need <laughs> for like your... Um, that's at your level like if you're new to something it can be quite mm -hmm. daunting you feel like you're being judged yep. or it's like back to um, more than likely a traumatic experience with uni assessments um and it's like oh no yep. there's, there's no this is a safe kind of exploration Absolutely. to try things try different things um and experiment. make mistakes get things yeah. wrong like yeah and um, reflect on them and learn from them yeah uh, learn from both the Absolutely. you know strengths 
based, but like learn from the good and bad. What went well? What didn't go well? Yeah. Why did it? Why did Definitely. it go well? Why did it go not so well? What would you have liked to done, have done instead? I think my uh, my OCD brain does that a lot with um, session, like client sessions. Like so, after I finished a session, I'll kind of like have a, a, a think over it. Sometimes to my detriment, so I will think about it too much. Um, but it's incredibly helpful to be able to do that with other people um who do approach things in in different ways um uh, yeah I think I think we need more of that I really do think we need more of that and I've definitely said some things in sessions where if you I mean if you lose somebody and if you lose that relationship it's gone for the entire session it's very difficult to bring that back with somebody that you're working with um some things that I've said I've definitely said to somebody maybe seven years ago uh pain is all in your brain which I would not dream of saying now like there's no part of me that would not come up in a session at all but I hope it's a good thing that my practice is moving forward um and communication is moving forward but I do think we need more kind of you know open uh examples of communication so what you're doing with showing your your sessions is incredibly helpful I'd recommend that people go and watch it or ask you for the session because it's great yeah and even just um, hearing you um, reflect on some of the mistakes that you made, I think is also a game changer because people are generally not uh, going to showcase their, uh, you know, blunders or or bloopers in, yeah. on Instagram or like uh, what I did wrong, what I was wrong in, because there's that kind of stigma of like, what? You're a professional. We should always be right. Yeah. It's like, well, no, we learn and we are human too. And this is actually normal. And to be Absolutely. expected as part of growth. If you're not looking back at what you were doing seven years ago with yeah. cringe, then you <laughs> probably haven't really improved as much as you could have. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. And without turning this into my own personal therapy session, that's something I've worked on with within kind of OCD therapy because I have such an extreme view of perfectionism that I I, I find it very difficult to make mistakes. So we actually looked back at some of my previous work and used it as almost like exposure therapy. Um but it's useful and uh, I will never say to somebody pain is all in your brain ever again. So exactly. Yep. The, there we go. <laughs> the pain explaining part is, um, oh, yeah. Is, yeah. Very silenced now. Um, and you're now aware yeah, of it absolutely. as well. And I get that tendency myself yeah. of like the re- writing reflex of like, Oh, if only they knew a bit more. Um, and yeah, I think having the, the reflection is key. Having the awareness of what yeah. we used to say, um, so then now when we say things, we're at least more mindful and thoughtful behind mm-hmm. yeah. like the, the meaning, the intention, the interaction, how it's landing. It's like, well, next level Absolutely. kind of thinking framework. Um, that yeah. so My kind of um, challenge is selling it. And I, I mean it in a sense of uh, people don't seem to flock to courses of um, philosophy, thinking frameworks, clinical reasoning, but mm-hmm. they still flock yep. towards the specific exercise for oh, XYZ yeah. condition. I'm not sure if that's also just m- what, like my bias and um, my N equals one mm-hmm. experience of what I see. And I'm sure there's other communities out there that value yeah. the interactions, the learning about contextual effects um, and a bit more of a wider perspective. Um, but yeah, a lot of people, are, you, you talk about biopsychosocial and they're like, what? It's in your head. Yeah, is that what you're saying absolutely. I I think with massage we tend to see a lot of people focus on learning the next technique or learning cupping or learning myofascial release or I I haven't done any of those things so I actually can't comment on what the courses are like. But um, I think I would love for there to be more focus on people uh, maybe gravitating towards motivational interviewing courses maybe because um, we we have to as massage therapists still take a complete history like a physio would or or we should take a complete history I'm not sure everybody does but um I would love for people to focus maybe kind of move away on solely looking for the next manual therapy technique um which I hate that phrase as well it kind of sounds like you're fixing a car or something um and more towards courses that maybe give you the confidence to work with somebody in pain because you so frequently hear massage therapists say like oh, I didn't feel safe working with that person or I didn't feel confident working with that person but a really large proportion of people come to massage therapists because they're in pain it just seems like there's a bit of a disconnect between what people are learning and how they then have to go and apply that in the 
big wide world and also I've had a couple of instances where quite serious medical conditions have been missed by massage therapists so uh, one was called Requina um, and another one uh, the lady that I've worked with allows me to share this story by the way so there's permission um, a knot that was in her pectoral muscle that turned out to be breast cancer so if we could learn a little bit more around how to work with people, how to identify things that need referring on rather than just sticking things into people or pushing on muscles, then I think we'd, we'd hopefully move forward a little bit more of a profession. And I know they're two very extreme examples, but <clears throat> I would love massage therapists. And I think, again, I'm biased. I'm very much kind of within that. I do try and like dip out of that community because I'm very cautious of creating an echo chamber for myself. But um I, I do tend to chat with a lot of the massage therapists that are more person focused, how to hold space for people, learning philosophical approaches, learning how to not pain explain. Um, but I would love more therapists to go in that direction rather than just concentrating on when can I book my dry needling course or when can I do cupping or have you got a discount code for my fascial release? It's I, I would love for the industry to I guess that would be my utopia coming back to that question. <laughs> Yeah, for, for people um, to see and experience the value of the the contextual side, yes. the, the the wider perspective, not the like very zoomed in minutia or adding little yeah. tools to your toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the whole philosophy of body as machine and this is what's wrong. Oh. And so if you just have more tools in your toolbox, you'll be better. Um, yeah, That's pervasive across the physical therapies particularly with musculoskeletal mm -hmm. pain mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's uh it's tough it is tough but I, I mean like I said to you as well I'm having conversations with people that I wouldn't have had five six years ago which is is amazing and I think a lot of people are understanding now that maybe somebody putting an elbow in your glutes over a period of 10 weeks isn't going to have the resolve that they it might feel great temporarily but we probably need to look at a bit of a bigger, bigger picture as to what's going on, which ultimately, um, you know, I think builds a lot more trust with the the therapeutic relationship, costs the person who's working with you less if they're they're in a private setting, or costs them less in terms of their their time, maybe if they're in a a public setting. Um, yeah, I I mean, it's, I think it seems to be working okay for me. I'm not a very I'm not a very business orientated person I think um I'm very much le I like to leave if somebody chooses to work with me again in their hands not in my decision making um and it seems to be going okay I guess um but it, it just doesn't feel comfortable for me to be like let's get you in for 10 sessions pass me your credit card no yeah the not... autonomy is valued in <clears throat> hugely price. yeah hugely my final curiosity question um, is next step for you. What would be your learning, growth, uh, development, getting into a new area or e expanding on something in relation to what you're already doing when it comes to uh, everything to do with massage, career-wise, out of curiosity? Um Everybody has so many plans and I have no plans at the moment. I am just quite happy where I am. Um, I have thought about different areas that I want to move into, but I think focusing, I guess, more on philosophical underpinnings that I can apply to my practice is something that I'm really interested in um, exploring more. Um, I have thought about potentially moving into the more psychology based direction but I have a habit of just chasing qualifications when I'm not sure where to go which is also not something that I want to just jump into um so at the moment I don't know I am offering not publicly at the moment but uh, uh more one-to-one -one peer support to other massage therapists that I want to moving away want to move away from the kind of biomedical biomechanical models of massage so I'm excited to see where that goes um people have so many plans and I just don't really feel like I have a lot of plans at the moment I'm kind of happy just where I am and developing skills in with, with the people that I'm working with I guess but and probably fostering the community aspect of what we have going on in Sheffield a little bit more but maybe in a year that will be different but at the moment yeah what about you 
Yeah, great. Um, I just wanted yeah. to highlight, like listening to what you've just said, the um, assumption that the the next stage is always like a, a, a title or um, I know, <clears throat> more success in whatever uh, traditional way that might be. But yeah, what I think there's so much value in, in um, continuing to uh, foster and build a community, even mm -hmm. though that might not get you a yeah. professional title or like, you know, yeah. something on your resume. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think, uh, for me, very similar with, uh, so there's different avenues. I've always been in the past four years of, um, upskilled as much as possible in, within psych mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I was gonna mm -hmm. ask if you've gone through, um, any psychology courses, cause I know that there's a lot that uh, online or in person, um, m most of them are okay if you're not a qualified psychologist, but if you're a healthcare yeah. worker, so I've like, I've been to Russ Harris, who does a lot of acceptance and commitment yeah. therapy. Um, yeah. He's got online stuff. Um, fortunate to work with a psychologist, Anthony Berrick, who works within okay. the ACT framework. Laura Rathbone yeah. as well. Yeah, I know, Laura, you know. yeah. Oh, I love uh, her. So there's already so much out there um, for psychs, whether or not you get a formal degree. Um, mm -hmm. There's still the training and the skills that you can still um, yep. learn. I'm just thinking you general, not, not you, you like what you should do no, anyway, no, no. But yeah, in general yeah. for, for listeners. Um, so for me yeah. still along that kind of act line, narrative therapy was a mind blowing yes. experience. Um, I don't, I, it's such a different world. It's hard to describe to a, uh, I guess, MSK world, mm -hmm. but we talk about narratives. We talk about stories. So yep. um valuing the power of strengthening people's meanings that they have to their yes. experiences is and it's been such a fundamental change in my approach um to looking at um things like community stuff things like because uh, mm -hmm. it, it was uh, originated from social workers who looked at a lot of psychologically yeah, informed yeah, practices yeah. um you probably come across narrative medicine is another mm -hmm. term used yeah um, so yep, yep. Doing that, so I did a week intensive uh, this year, I think early this year or late last year. I'm doing another Amazing. one, um, level two. So yeah, really keen Very to nice. uh, continue yeah. that. Uh, and sociology is the other world that I'm diving into. Mm. Um, so the social stuff. Um, while still keeping my toes in, like updating and refreshing red flags and like the biomedical stuff is still uh, 100%, I think, yeah. important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know what where I'm going direction wise. I have <clears> a name for it, but that's my curiosity. Yeah. Um. So you might see that in the differences in the content that I share uh, online. Exciting. Yeah. It's really exciting. It's been an amazing I think we need chat. It. A really. Oh, thank you. I yeah, love chatting as well. Yeah. Yeah. The um the opportunity for a virtual coffee has been awesome and. I Lovely. really appreciate so all, all the, the insights, your vulnerability and sharing your story, your experiences. Um, hopefully this we've like role model, just like a casual chat as well mm. that people can have I loved it. Yeah. online uh, as well mm. to reach out to people. Yeah. Um, so for those who are interested in learning more about you, highly recommend following mm -hmm. your Instagram framework sports massage. Yep. Hopefully I got the Every, user framework name. sports massage everywhere, <laughs> just everywhere. everywhere, website, Gmail, Facebook. Where it, Instagram, you, wherever you want to find me. Your preferred is Instagram? Uh, yeah, sure. Just wherever. To be wherever. Um, wherever people want to get in touch with me, it's absolutely fine. Open Amazing. open lines of communication. Cool. And is there anything that we've missed that I think we covered all the, the topics, the dot points? Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. I've, um, Like I said, I've wanted to speak to you for a while and I was going to reach out later in the year. So this has been perfect. Uh, there's some things that I've definitely taken away from our chat as well. And narrative, I think narrative medicine um, mm -hmm. is something that I've wanted to to kind of delve into a little bit more for a while. So maybe that'll be my next route to go down. Yes. We shall see. Yeah. Exciting. Amazing. And um, hopefully the next time we chat, I've got an uh, amazing, supportive, uh, built a community uh, full of altruism. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the, um, <laughs> Yeah, the outcomes because you've like, yeah. sparked some curiosity and it's it's like so obvious to me to just direct message people if they need that help and yeah services. i think what i would say is maybe go in not expecting a response yep that's probably i don't but maybe that's my my kind of 
but maybe that's my biomedical head talking like I was always told to never expect the outcome that you want in science because you're probably not going to get it so suck it up move on um and I feel like that is the uh, the the direction that I started that was actually one of my lecturers who said that directly to me and told me to stop having a tantrum so I've taken that throughout my entire life um just expect, don't expect a response sometimes people will carry on a conversation for a while and it just turns out you're not going to be the right person um <laughs> run things that nobody turns up to as well but don't stop mm. there um because I think a lot of people kind of offer things and there's no response and that's the end of it and it's not the case maybe it's just not the right time for people maybe messaging hasn't resonated with people uh, maybe kind of you're not necessarily feeling comfortable in what you're offering so just keep persisting there are people that want these kind of um services and are probably struggling to find them at the moment so yep makes complete keep sense going. there's uh increasing ask, ask me any questions oh, yep. amazing yes and um ask me any questions yeah really appreciate this chat and yeah keen for the next one you so much me too thanks so much Emily. absolutely thank you so much